Wanted to do a quick breakdown sort of sense making exercise here with regards to safety signals around vaccine safety. Now, um, people are obviously concerned about this and I think rightfully so. We're gonna, we're gonna look at the data here and kind of uh, sort of understand what's going on. Um, but a lot of the inspiration behind why I wanted to do this particular piece came from watching a journalism conference uh, yesterday at Carleton University um, with regards to the Freedom Convoy and the mainstream journalists who were there on the ground discussing this um, and understanding as we were watching it sort of where their perspective around COVID-19 was coming from and where their uh, perspective of around why people were there, where that was coming from, how they were judging that. And a lot of it had to do with perhaps not doing a good faith amount of investigation, a good faith amount of research into um, the actual concerns that people have on the ground where they came from. Like, is there data to support the vaccine hesitancy that a lot of people had when it came to not wanting to take part in vaccine mandates? And if you were to listen to those uh, journalists, they would say, no, it was all just conspiracy theorists. So what I wanted to do is kind of create a piece, which I'm actually going to send to them. And I'm going to say, look, this is part of the reason why people are concerned. It's based much more on data than anybody sort of realizes uh, in that in that sphere of, of mainstream uh, conjecture, if you will. So. Basically, if we were to look at um, where, how we can know, how can we know here in Canada, for example, how much uh, vaccine injury is happening related to COVID-19? How could we possibly know that? Now, we have the, the reporting system here in Canada, and, and it's, it's, you can see it here. Um, it basically is indicating that, look, we've, we've given out about 80, 80 million doses. Um, 40,000 people or so have reported adverse events. Of that, you know, 31,596 uh, were considered non-serious. 8,415 were considered serious. They claim here that all serious events undergo medical review to see if there are any safety issues needing further action. These processes include meeting regularly to review the data, prevent and territory partners and uh, regulator research networks and medical advisors. Any unexpected uh, safety concerns are detected quickly and acted upon immediately. So, you know, they're basically saying we investigate, we look at stuff. I mean, we're seeing 8,415 of them. Well, how do we know that that's, that number is right? Uh, there's, there's oftentimes this discussion of underreporting. How can we know if this number is underreported? Well, one of the ways we've talked about on this channel many, many times over the last uh, year or so is we can actually look at the Pfizer trial data, the clinical trial data, and we can say what in that data might signal whether or not this number is accurate. This is from the clinical trial. We're seeing uh, one column there that says the amount of people, uh, sorry, that, that's the vaccine group. The other group is uh, the placebo group. And we can see here, right, any adverse event. And then we have under that, we have severe, 1.2% right, 262 or 1.2 percent. But then we have any serious adverse event, 0 0.6, 127 or 0 0.6. So which number do we choose there? What is severe? What is serious? Now, I, I've spoken to a couple people and they've said that serious may mean that it required hospitalization or immediate intervention. But there's not a lot of clarity on that and Pfizer has not provided that. Okay, so it's a little bit difficult to know which number to choose here when we're talking about what percent of people, at what rate are we seeing severe adverse events? So we can play with 1.2% or we can play with 0.6. Okay, so we're gonna run them both. Now, if we go back to the Canadian data and we say, well, there's about 30 million people have been vaccinated that produce the numbers that we're seeing here. Now, that Pfizer clinical trial data was uh, people between 16 uh, and I believe 64, 65 years old, somewhere around that range. So I went into Canadian, uh, the Canadian data, you can look at this table here, and I just chose everybody that's 18 or older. That's the closest I could get to producing what the Pfizer trial data uh, produces. And in Canada here, that totals to about 27 million people. So I then processed that, I multiplied uh, that number by uh, one point, uh, 2% and by 0.6% and I got two different numbers. So then I got uh, basically that there's about 333,375 people that have had a severe adverse event or there's 166,687 people that have had a serious adverse event depending on how this is defined. This is what we would expect to see if what has happened and calculated in the real world is what we would expect from what we saw in the clinical trial. Right? So what we're seeing is that Canada is only reporting 8,415 adverse events, but we would expect to see one of these other two numbers when we're talking about serious or severe adverse events. Why are these numbers being underreported by 40 times or by 20 times? 
it's hard to know, right? There's, there's a, a lack of clarity around what is severe and what is serious. There's also a lack of clarity around why the Canadian numbers in their reporting system is so dramatically low in comparison to what happened in the clinical trial. In the clinical trial, you're generally working with healthy people. Um, and you know, in the real world, you're, you're now exposing that medical intervention that you tested in the clinical trial to people that may not be as healthy, that might be older, that might be immunocompromised. So you would also expect that whatever rate you saw severe adverse uh, reactions in the trial, you would expect in the real world, it would likely be a little bit greater. Right? So we're still being conservative with our numbers here by doing this. And when we're talking about serious or severe adverse events, Pfizer defines this kind of stuff as, uh, you know, based on this table here that you see, this table was part of a data set that was um, uh, uh, obtained from a Freedom of Information Act request. Again, the FDA did not want to release this data. They uh, actually were taken to court to get this data released. And you got to think just within that, why is there a reluctance on health authorities to not want to release and be transparent about this data? This data is what supported their decision to make um, the Pfizer available under the Emergency Youth Author Authorization Act. And even within a lot of this data, they've redacted certain bits of information that show the rate of of these events happening, right? So even in this piece of uh, this data here, which showed the amount of adverse events that were uh, tabulated that Pfizer knew about within the first three months of actually putting out this vaccine, they've hidden for some particular reason, uh, the rate that it's actually happening, which would help us greatly in understanding, you know, how prevalent this is, right? Uh, surprise, surprise, they've not been transparent about this. So um, we come back to this and we see in this, in this table that you know, it could be general disorders that are both severe or non-severe. Uh, it could be nervous system related. It could be musculoskeletal. It could be gastrointestinal, respiratory, skin, infection, whatever it might be. These different types of severe reactions are broken down into serious and not serious. Is there a ton of clarity here? No, but the point is, is that some of these people, they might have needed, you know, medical treatment right away. Some of them might not have. Some of them might be dealing with something that's lifelong. Some of them might not, we, we just don't know, right? But what we see here is that at the end of the day, the amount of severe adverse injuries that are being, or reactions, if you will, that are being uh, purported or reported on the Canadian government website is dramatically different from what we see in the Pfizer clinical trial. What journalist, civilian, politician out there is in good faith going, hmm, I wonder why that number is so low as reported by Canada, and then going to the Pfizer data and saying, hmm, what's going on here? Why is there such a big discrepancy, right? And if they're not doing that, which a lot of mainstream journalists doesn't appear to be that they're doing that, is this what's informing their perspective that, oh no, all these adverse events are exceedingly rare. And therefore these people that are concerned, uh, they're not really operating off of good ideas, they're operating off of misinformation and conspiracy. But we're seeing based on just data that that is not true. People do have data to support their decisions. They do have data to support their ideas, but there's perhaps not a good faith effort to discuss them at the legacy media level, right? So um, a couple of limitations here I did want to point out. Obviously, when we're talking about those 27 million people in Canada that I used to, to do this calculation, some of them may have gotten Moderna, uh, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, maybe a mix of both, maybe Johnson & Johnson. But generally, we know that Moderna, AstraZeneca, and even Johnson & Johnson, there was a lot of um, adverse events reported from that. We, we didn't hear a whole lot about uh, adverse events in the media, talked about with, um, with regards to the Pfizer va vaccination. A lot of it was just, you know, Moderna is, is maybe not good for this age group of people. It's producing a lot of myocarditis. Or we heard that, you know, AstraZeneca is being paused because there's a lot of issues. So if anything, the data here is still very conservative. It's on the conservative end. And uh, I think that makes it meaningful. And, you know, again, why is it that this underreporting is happening? It's hard to say exactly. It could be that um, people are, uh, they're not knowing like what to do about it. Uh, doctors, we've spoken to a number of doctors here in Canada. A lot of them don't know that there's a reporting system available for them to actually report to. Um, they don't know how to do it or they don't have the time to do it. it. Usually takes 30 minutes to an hour to fill out the paperwork to submit it. We've heard on a number of occasions that people just don't have the time to do that. And therefore a lot of this stuff is going underreported. There's also, we've spoken to a number of people who have experienced vaccine injuries and, and done investigations and, and determined that a lot of people, 
their, their injury is not being acknowledged by their doctor. The doctor believes that it couldn't possibly come from the vaccine, probably because of the numbers they see on the government's website. And therefore they're just kind of saying, well, no, this, this couldn't be from the vaccine. And so it's not getting reported either. So there's, there is an issue when you take the time to look at it, when you, when you take the time to say, hey, what is actually going on here? And, and is there reason to believe that underreporting is a, is a thing that's happening? Um, and the answer is, that's what we found. We found that the data supports that there's severe underreporting and that people's on the ground experience is that doctors don't always know what to do or where to report to. And a lot of doctors sometimes are not even acknowledging uh, that there's potential vaccine uh, events happening. So why is this important is because when people are making decisions, should I be vaccinated? They're determining what's my risk of severe disease from COVID. And they determine, well, my risk isn't that high. Like even unvaccinated people, the risk of them ending up in hospital across all age groups is less than 1%, right? So when you're assessing as a 30 year old, do I need to be vaccinated? Well, I mean, my chances of severe disease is super low, right? I probably don't need to be vaccinated. And then on top of that, you look, what's the chance that I might have a severe reaction when I'm talking about something I'm not already, already at risk to? Well, the severe reaction is, you know, a, a decent amount. Right. So maybe I even more so don't want to get the vaccine. These are very important things to consider. And it, it's part of a, a overall discourse that helps people understand why people are making decisions. And it just seems that the, at the legacy level, when we're coming to media, um, they're not acknowledging this type of data. And instead, they're just saying, well, it's all just conspiracy theory that's informing people's ideas. And I hope what I presented today is pretty clear that it's not about conspiracy theory. We're looking at real data here um, and it informs why people are concerned. So if you like this video, you know, please like, subscribe and pass it on to somebody else. That's it. That's all.